epic. Have you ever potty trained a child? It can be a messy situation. I've potty trained three out of four of my kids. Uh, one to go, and the last one, praise God, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but when my oldest son, Luke, who's now seven, when he was two, we were in potty training phase of life, and our friends invited us over to their house to dinner one night. And so we went over, and we're sitting around their very nice dining room table. And I look over at Luke, and I see this look of embarrassment kind of like fall upon his face, and I'm like, oh no, I know what just happened. So I go over, and I pick him up, and sure enough, all over this, the chair, it's all wet. Their fancy, nice chair is soaked, and I just feel so bad about what, that, what just happened. So I pick up Luke, and bring him to the bathroom, and, and, and take off his pants. To, and you may not know this if you haven't done it, but I didn't know this until I started potty training, but apparently the strategy is that the kid is supposed to go for about a week or so with no pants on. So you try and keep him at home as much as possible. I don't know how that works. But so anyways, I take his pants off, and I'm like, all right, he's done. I'm going to go back to dinner. We'll clean him up and finish up later. So I go back to the table and let Luke kind of run around because he's done with dinner. True story. I'm at the Seckles house. And I have a view from my seat it, down their hallway, and I see Luke do something that he should not be doing. He was not done. He sit, he squats, and I'm sitting back, and I'm like, this look of panic and fear just on my face. And yes, he just goes number two right there on our friend's hallway floor. It was the worst. It was the worst. I have not been invited back <laughs> to their house. My wife has, but uh, that was an epic parent fail, right? Hashtag parent fail. How do you come back from something like that? You just don't. You just move on. How do you come back? How do you come back from failure in life? Some failures that we experience are small, really not, you know, we can look back a couple months later and just laugh at them. So other failures that we do or that are, we experience really wound us deeply, deep down in our hearts. And the question that we want to talk about today is, are you defined by your failures? Are you defined by your past? Many people believe that you are your behavior. You are what you have done or what's been done to you. Is that true? Maybe even a more important question. How, what does God think of you and me in the midst of our failures? I got some good news for you on this Easter Sunday. God, ultimately what matters is what God alone thinks. And I've got some good news about what God, what God thinks. So, uh, welcome to Grace. My name is Jesse. I'm the campus pastor here at the North Park campus. How you guys doing? 11 o'clock? Awesome. Well, uh, uh, how about that spoken word video that got us started? That was incredible, wasn't it? Our very own Jeremiah Bonds bringing uh, just awesome word. And he, you can look him up on Spotify, actually. I follow him. He's got a, an album called Baggage Claim. It's really good. Check him out. Um, online campus, Facebook Live. However you're joining us, maybe behind a computer screen or a phone, welcome you as well. If you're new to this community, I hope that you feel warmly welcomed in this place. We're glad that you're here, and uh, you can make this place your home. We would love that. Uh, we're going to be opening up a Bible to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. Our incredible ushers. What's up, is Anthony? Uh, what's up, girl? Uh, are gonna, if you want a Bible, raise your hand. Should, they will hook you up. It's page 267 in the House Bible, the blue guy. How do you feel about a messy home? Are you the kind of person you're like, yeah, I went to college and lived in the dorms, but never really grew up, and I, I'm cool with a messy home? Most people, you're like, no, I want my house to be clean. But sometimes a mess can be a good thing. For example, when you walk into my home, and you, in the entryway, and you look at, on the wall, there's a poster thing or whatever it is, piece of wood, whatever. It says, pardon the mess, but our children are making memories. You see, if we wanted our kids, if we wanted our house to be clean, we would just plop them in front of the TV, put a video game controller in their hand, and they'd be like zombies, kind of like on the black mirror. Uh, and you know what? Our kids play video games, and they watch TV. They, we're not those kind of parents that like totally cut it out. But we encourage them to go have fun and to get off the TV and to go explore and, and make a mess and make do art projects. And, and all of that mess is a sign that our kids are just alive and having fun and all that kind of stuff. When it comes to people and community, 
a messy community, to me, is a sign of people being real. People being honest. People finally feeling safe enough to say, you know what, this is what's really going on. Things are not always okay. And a messy community is a sign that God is doing something and changing a person's life. We are imperfect people at this church. This is an imperfect church. We're a messy group of people. Welcome. (laughs) And, you know, we don't, we love our messy church. We don't, of course, glory in the mess. The goal is not to be a mess. But that is the starting point for God to do a new thing in us. And and sometimes that mess takes time to clean up. Some people grow quick and some people grow slowly. For example, uh, a little over 17 years ago when I gave my life to Christ, I had just finished uh, a four-year substance abuse, drug addiction uh, for meth. And I went to jail and then five days later got out and gave my life to Christ. And I haven't done a drug since that day. And that is a quick change. But also, I have other areas of my life where it's been much more slow. And I wrestle with sin on a daily basis, just like the rest of you. I'll just be honest and say it. You want me to come around with a microphone and we can all go around? I mean, we all deal with these, and we need to be patient with ourselves when we aren't growing at the speed that we want. This is not an excuse to disobey God, right? Because when we obey God, you come to realize at some point, it actually is what gives you life when you are obedient to God. It's not an excuse to just abuse God's grace because, oh, God's just going to forgive me so I can just go do whatever I want and, and, and take advantage of his grace. It's not an excuse to, to not understand that the power of God's spirit in us really does change us and transform us. But there's, we need to have, there's a certain inevitability that we're going to struggle through life and have to battle things in our lives, and, and we understand that. And God understands that. And so you can, we can, you can just kind of relax a little. Take a deep breath. <laughs> well, there's no pressure to be perfect in this place. That pressure is only counterproductive to the incredible transformational work that God wants to do in your life. Not alone. You are loved. You are welcomed here. God sees you. God knows you. He knows everything about you. And he loves you. Amen, Christine. I think that's Christina, huh? Love you, girl. All right. King David uh, is a man who most guys, like, want to be like. If you know anything about this guy, man's man. He was successful in everything that he put his mind to. He was very successful as a leader. He was, uh, he was brave. He led the armies of Israel to conquer, and he just stood for, for what was right. He was incredibly courageous. He was a ladies' man. He knew how to, like, swoon the ladies. Uh, and that got him into a lot of trouble. It's not always a good thing to have that power. Uh, He was admired by the community. People really looked up to him. He was a man after God's own heart, Scripture declares. But he was also a man that his behavior got the best of him. And he failed miserably many times. He wrote Psalm chapter 40 that we're going to be looking at today. And he's going to describe to us how God delivers a person. And there's rules to how God delivers a person. When I think of God being like a a deliverer, I think a little bit of like a UPS man (laughs) or a FedEx driver. You know, he like takes the package from one place and moves it to another place. And to get your package in Amazon Prime time, like the two-day, you know, there's rules to how it's going to happen. And in a similar way, there's six rules that we're going to discover about we need to put it, we need to do if we want to be delivered by God. And so Psalm 40 breaks it down. I waited patiently for the Lord. This is a reoccurring theme all throughout Scripture. The need for humanity to learn something we're not very good at. And it is to wait upon the Lord. This is a struggle for all of us because we want things now. Amazon Prime now, on the go. Um, I've had, you know, for silly example, I've had to wait seven years to get out of diaper phase. I'm like, Lord, I'm just waiting upon you to have to deal with this. But we don't like to wait for anything. American culture is enamored with fast, with now, with impulsive. And many of our failures in life can be attributed to impulsive decisions in life. Instead of learning to wait upon the Lord, for example, money. Man, how many of us have just, our credit cards have gotten away from us, or our ability to increase amount of debt 
and we don't realize that that catches up to us, and it, it's just like this weight that overcomes us. Or how about giving your, giving your heart away prematurely to another person, where you thought that Mr. Right was going to be right, and it turned out Mr. Right was way wrong. And we've, many of us have experienced that failure on the job, failure at home, feeling like, man, I, I just am so overwhelmed with my children, and maybe this is just me, where anger just wants to boil up inside of me, and, I, and we often feel like failures with our kids or our spouses, instead of cherishing the gift that God has given us, we grow in contempt for them because of the little, all, all both of our flaws that just play off of each other in this crazy cycle, and, and, in, and, and we feel like a failure when it comes to family. And one of the ways that we deal is with, we develop these habits and these patterns in our lives to numb and to deal with the pain inside. We develop these addictions. And please do not think of a drug addict with a needle hanging out of his or her arm. We all can fall in so quickly to these habits and patterns. So much of it is on our phones to satisfy the deep longings in our heart that cannot satisfy us. The Lord says, rule number one, we need to learn to wait patiently upon the Lord in his timeline to deliver us, to change us. And the cool thing is that he shapes us as we wait upon him. He goes on, he inclined to me and he heard my cry. This is God. He hears the cry of King David. King David is having this raw, honest, crying out to God, probably from his own heart. You cannot skip this step. If you want to be delivered by God, do you want to be, let be God to be your deliverer? You cannot skip the fact that, you ha that you, there's a point where you cry out to God. God will not force himself upon you. He will not come and deliver you unless you say, God, I need your help. I'm crying out to you. And off pride keeps us often from letting God do that. Pride in our hearts keeps God at arm's distance and says, God, don't come near me. But when you are able to let, when God melts that pride away in your heart and you can get over that hump and you begin to cry out to God, you'll see things begin to change. And sometimes they change quick. It is awesome. I, there's so many stories I see of God just coming into someone's life when they cry out and just change. And God begins to move. Check out how he moves. He inclined to me when I cried out. He inclines me. This, this word means that God came down. He came near. He draws near to us when we cry out to him. Failure is meant to be a catalyst of faith for God to come near to us. God wants to draw near to us when we fail. Often we think when we're in the pit of failure, God turns his back and runs from us. But that is not who God is. Amen? Our failure is, is, is the way that God comes and restores. If you want to be delivered, you, we ha you have to do it. You have to, in humility, cry out to God, and he comes in that place. Verse 2 goes on. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. I don't think David was actually in some sort of pit, but I think, I think he felt like he was in a pit. He felt like he was in this... Uh, miry bog, almost like a slime pit. You're like slimed by all the gross stuff. You just feel like you're covered in this mud of shame and guilt. You feel like you're, you can't get yourself out of it. You're caught in this quicksand that's just pulling you down. Have you ever felt like that in life where you feel like, I cannot, I'm out of control. I want to change it and it's just out of control. Let me tell you about the nature of sin. Sin Number one is not an insult, so don't feel insulted by identifying with that. It's, an, it's a um, diagnosis of our condition. Let me tell you about our condition, is that sin doesn't stay small. At first we think we got it. You know, I can play with it a little bit, I can manage it a little bit, but Jesus says sin is like yeast. It's like yeast. A little bit begins to work its way through the whole thing. And what we thought we could control and manage begins to grow, and like a vortex just sucks us down, and we're like, man, I don't have control over this thing anymore. Sin is also, uh, it, it feels good at first, doesn't it? You could say yes, it does. 
I know it does because that's how I ended up in that pit uh, of drug addiction and all that kinds of stuff that I'm still battling with. But here's the reality. You get, you mature to a point where you're beginning to realize that what I thought was good actually smells really bad. And you begin to see it for what it really is. God begins to open up your spiritual eyes. He begins to open up your heart in his grace to see where you actually are at in life. And, you're, and you begin to come to your senses and see, God, I am covered in this mud. And notice that God doesn't put us in the pit. God doesn't put us in the pit. Who puts us in the pit? We, put, we do a cannonball <laughs> into this pit. We're like, man, that looks good. I'm going to go jump into that pit. God doesn't put you in it. Sometimes people will be in the pit and be like, hey, come smell it over here. It's awesome. This pit of destruction, you're going to love it. Come on into the slime. And we're like, okay. Or, you know, sometimes people hurt us and they throw us into that pit. There's a number of ways to get into that pit, but make it, I want to make it clear to you, God does not put you into that pit. What does God do? God delivers you. He pulls you. He comes down, and he pulls you up out of the pit. That is who God is. God is a rescuer. Do you know that for your life? He rescues you. Do you know that he is a deliverer for you in your life? This is who God is, and hope is alive today because of who God is. He moves on. He says, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. This is a cool, this is a cool contrast of where We put ourselves in where God delivers us to. This firm, secure foundation of life. And if you've experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. It is what God does to a person. He makes you strong. How does he do that? I love the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, we have some of the richest teaching. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And at the end of that teaching, Jesus says this. He says, if any person takes the words that I just spoke to you and puts them into practice, it's like a person who builds their house, their life upon the what? On the rock. Instead of building your life upon the sand, the storms are going to come either way, but you will not be shaken. You will be firm. It's not about what, see, how you think is incredibly important. It is crucial. Clear and accurate thinking about yourself and about God makes matters so much. Because there are pits of destruction all around you. And just because God pulled you out of one doesn't mean you're not going to do a swan dive into the next one. And God in his grace, he'll come down and pull you out of that one too. But if you just want to stay out of that and on a firm foundation, a secure, stable footing, you're not going to just agree with mental information, theological premises about God. You're going to say, God, I'm going to put it into practice and you will be strong. David goes on, because God has laid him upon a new foundation of life, a new stable life. David proclaims, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. God has done a new thing for the life of David, and David can't help but sing about it. It is awesome. And if you have experienced that kind of deliverance, and you know it in your heart, and it is real, there are deep caverns from your soul just comes praise and glory and worship to God because of who he is and because of what he's done. You don't see God, you don't kind of blame God for putting you in the pit. You begin to praise God that he has delivered you out of it. I love this, I love the movie uh, The Greatest Showman. Uh, And there's a character in this story called Letty Luz. And uh, there's many reasons why she um, hides and why she lives in the shadows. And it's cool to hear how shame is just being broken over her life and how she sings this new song. The song is called This Is Me. I want to read for you a few lyrics. I want to sing it, but I won't. (laughs) I am not a stranger to the dark, she says. Hide away, they say, because we don't want your broken parts. I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they say. No one will love you as you are. When the sharpest words want to cut me down, I'm going to send a flood, going to drown them out. I am brave. I am bruised. I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. And then it goes, look out, because here I come. (laughs) I'm going to, it's awesome. 
I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. When God delivers a person out of shame and hiding and darkness, and he breaks shame over your life, you're just like, I'm not afraid for people to know the real me anymore. I know who I am in God. I have a new identity. I'm a new creation in God. It is incredible. You're transformed from the inside out. And this new song of praise flows from deep caverns within your soul and, great, and thanks to God. And I want you to know, if you, have, if you don't sing a song like that, I want to give you permission. Can I give you permission? I want to give you permission. Maybe today is a change for you where, where you begin to worship God and sing a new song of praise to God that, is, that changes your life from this day forward. He goes on, he says, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. David says, I have experienced the deliverer, and I want other people to experience it as well. I want people to see and to have this fear, this reverent fear, not terrified fear, but holy, oh my, holy, reverent fear of God, you are bigger than me. And he's saying, I want other people to put their trust in the Lord because I have and I've experienced it. Have you experienced the, the power of the, of the Lord to deliver you? You want other people to experience it, don't you? So I'm like, I hope my friend right here does. Uh, there's a girl at this church, her name's Amanda Ortega, and she has her own story of being delivered by God. And I want you to, uh, to check out a story of a dear friend of mine. Check out the screens. Man, my childhood and teenage years were really rough. I experienced physical abuse and sexual abuse for many years, and it put me in a place of confusion. I was a victim. I had to kind of figure it out on my own, so that just manifested in anger. And so I was really, really angry. I did anything I could to forget, to numb it, because it wasn't going away. And so I just had to cope somehow. I felt like I wanted the world to hear me, for someone, just anyone to listen. But um, there was no one there. I was all alone, and it sucked <laughs> um, because I longed for love, and it didn't exist in my family, in my world. I had no idea, no concept of what love could possibly be like. As a friend of ours invited us to go to church because they were checking it out, and so we decided, all right, let's go. And so. We went and it was the most unexpected but most beautiful thing I think that's ever happened in my life, for sure. So I always felt like, why me? I'm innocent, what did I do wrong? Um, why do I deserve this? And I realized when I finally was told that someone loved me unconditionally, that I didn't have to be anything specific. Like I was already chosen, that he knew me before anyone did. And that just blew my mind because I never felt known. Um, I always felt like no one understood me. And for the first time, I felt like I belonged to a family. And I needed to do nothing, to say nothing, to give nothing, have nothing. I could just arrive. You are made for something so much greater that your life has amazing purpose, like far beyond you could ever imagine. You are something. You are amazing that you're a child of God and that you are gonna move mountains like no one else can because you're you.
the courage, the, the, the honesty, the freedom that you just is pouring out of her heart. She is making no apologies. She knows who she is. She knows who she, uh, <laughs> she's declaring to you who she knows that she is. She is God's beloved. Do you hear that? She knows that about herself. She is chosen by God. Did you hear her say that? She knows that she belongs to God. She knows who she is. And she, she said, I don't have to change anything. I don't have to do anything. I can just receive and, and, be, and step into this new life with God. I don't have to like go to, you know, check a few boxes off of some church's like to-do list. I don't have to go clean up my life first to, for God to do this new, for me to be his child for shame to be broken over me. And at the end, her heart is just calling out to you. She's saying, I have been delivered by God. You can be delivered by God too. That is what she is saying. That's what she's trying to communicate. And that's what people that have experienced that reality of God are, are welcoming and inviting you to. This power to overcome failure, make no mistake about it, does not come from ourselves. It comes from God. We cannot make it happen within ourselves. At this church, we testify that God is God and we are not. That we are loved more than we can ever imagine by God, but we are flawed and broken more than we could ever understand. And if you keep reading to verse 12 in Psalm chapter 40, King David says, he says, my transgressions, my sin, my, my failures are more than the hairs on my head, is the imagery that he gives, that we are so broken and so loved, we need a power that comes from God, that doesn't come from within ourselves. Today is Easter. Why did Jesus, the Son of the living God, die on the cross and rise from the dead three days later? Hebrews 13 tells us, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. You may be thinking, God has got to be angry with me. God has got to be disappointed in me because I am of me. And other people are disappointed in me. But let me tell you the truth. That there is, that God does have anger. And God does have wrath. And there is death because of sin. The wages of sin is death. But let me tell you the good news. That all of the the, the justice required by God was poured out not upon you. It was poured out upon Jesus on the cross. And so you do not have to experience that. You do not have to, have to live with the repercussions of all that. That is good news, my friends. It is good news. The fancy theological word is propitiation, which just means that the justice of God was completely, totally satisfied upon Jesus the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so there's this great exchange that happens. You see, all of your shame and sin is, is put on Jesus, and, and in, in exchange, you receive the righteousness of Christ, which is what you need to be all of the things that happens when you place your faith in Jesus. Spiritually, you become white as snow. It's a cool image that the Bible gives. It's not this external thing, but when you place your faith in Jesus and all of that happens, you become spiritually, internally washed clean. All of the mire and the pit and the nast, the slime, is just washed away permanently by God. You see, when you place your faith in Jesus, he has some declarations over you. Let me give you some of the declarations that God proclaims over you. You are forgiven. God declares that you are forgiven. Everything you have or will ever do, it is forgiven by God. And you can forgive yourself because God wants, God has forgiven you. How can we not forgive ourselves? Number two, God declares that you have peace with God, the God of peace. That when you place your faith in Jesus and all that stuff happens, you from permanently have peace with God, a relationship with God. Number three, God declares that you are the righteousness of Christ. Yeah. We still make mistakes and we still sin and we still fail, but you are a holy one who has a bunch of stuff that you're still working on with God, and that takes time. You are not just a, a dirty sinner who's forgiven. And number four, God declares that you are adopted into his family. 
that changes everything. You become a child of God, born again. So many incredible things that God declares over you. And check it out. It's not based on what you do. It's by the blood of the eternal covenant. This is a firm, unshakable promise that God has made a covenant to humanity with that you can place your trust in. It's not based on you doing the right things or the wrong things. It's based on you placing your faith in Jesus Christ alone. But there is even more good news. You ready? Verse 21. Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because Jesus is awesome. The God that, the power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that God puts in your life by the Spirit of God to overcome failures because he's going to equip you and he's going to be working in you to overcome the things that you cannot overcome on your own. Yes, it may take time. Hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> that oft, often depends on how much you submit to the Word of God. We can get into that later. That's another sermon for next week, maybe. Uh, but God is committed to you, and he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And God gives us power. Hope is alive today because of who Jesus is and what he does in his life. Baptisms. Baptism represents this new, clean you. It happens the moment you are spiritually baptized, the moment you say yes to Jesus and place your faith in him. You are placed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Happened 2,000 or so years ago. You're placed in that and you're raised, as Jesus was raised, to new life with God. That's what happens spiritually. That's a personal decision and a moment between you and God. The water is just a symbol, a sign. It's a declaration, a public declaration of what you know to be true in your heart between you and Jesus. And you want everybody to know it. And it's a defining moment in your life where, you, where scripture, scripture tells us you place your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You get baptized. It's not for salvation, but it's just what you do. <laughs> and if you haven't, you can. Right now. In a moment, we're going to do it. And if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, we're going to say a prayer. And what did we learn today? That Jesus hears the cries. And he comes down. And he will deliver you from the pit, from, our, from your sin, and will do a lot of cool things in your life. Is God working in you right now? Do you want to talk to God? I'm going to lead you through a prayer. 17, a little, 18 years ago, I got arrested. I was in a pit. I was in jail. And five days later, I gave my life to Christ. And he placed me on a firm foundation. And my life has never been the same. Do you need God to change your life? You can talk to him right now. Let's all bow our heads and let's pray. You can just talk in the quietness of your own heart. Cry out to God. Say, God, I believe. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe, Jesus, that you love me and that you know me and you're not ashamed of me and you're not running from me. Your back is not to me, but your arms are wide open and I just want to come running into your arms, Jesus. I need you to hold me up, God, because I can't hold myself up, God. I've gotten myself into a pit of, of slime and sin and failure, God, and I need you to wash me clean, Jesus. I ask that you would come and forgive me. Come into my life, God. I, I, I surrender my heart and my future and my life to you, God. I want you to be the Lord, the leader, the king, the God of my life, God. You are in charge, and I surrender my life to you, Jesus. Make me white as snow. Cleanse me, God. Make me, I want to be your child. I want to be with you for eternity. And I want that to begin right now. And if there's anyone here who maybe, you know, sometimes we get a, a life change. Uh, we want a life change and we like cut our hair or we like change our hair color. But sometimes we need a, a, a life change and God has given us the gift of baptism. To, a, a defining mark in the sand of our timeline of our lives to say that God is doing a new thing. If you are feeling the stirring of God to take that stand, then you, I pray that God would put that in your heart and he would move you, move you to it. We pray these things. Thank you so much for being our deliverer.
We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.